Um, so welcome to the first uh, Critical Care Ultrasound Rounds. Excited to have you guys. Kind of the start off of, a, of hopefully a new new era. And I'd like to welcome the sites of the Alex. And of course, hopefully the Grey Nuns and Sturgeon hooked up as well. Disclosures, I have none. Um, but I do love Critical Care Ultrasound. So you'll hear me rant and rave and I get very excited. I also firmly believe it's be taught judiciously to people who care for critically ill patients. It's a, it's a valuable skill, and I hope you guys can come to appreciate that if you don't already. So why arounds? Well, ultrasound has been kind of emerging critical care now for at least the last decade to, to almost even two decades. And really it's coming into the spotlight in international and national um, uh, stage in terms of guidelines, recommendations, and, uh, and certainly lots of interest in how we apply it to caring for the critically ill. And so the purpose of this round really is to, is to talk about cases, discuss things, and really grow our collective wisdom. The point is not necessarily for me to talk at you guys, but hopefully for you guys to get engaged and go through some cases and, and contribute. And as things uh, take shape here throughout the year, I hope some of you can bring cases along to discuss. So hopefully we can get some people to, uh, to, to actually bring cases and address them collectively. I think it helps all of us uh, s slowly grow our, our knowledge and our experience. Um, we've seen, again, recommendations emerge from college chess physicians that, that are national slash international. We've seen them emerge in Canada for Canadian recommendations for critical care ultrasound training and competency. And as these recommendations have emerged, we've seen a whole kind of uh, a whole variety of recommendations emerge regarding training and, and competency and how we achieve this. And so rounds are really just a fundamental part of this whole structure in terms of building, again, building our collective wisdom. We will cover a vast array of topics throughout the year. This will be a monthly affair and everything from echo to lung to abdominal to, uh, to, to things like vascular, whether it applies to procedural guidance or to assessment of venous thromboses. So I hope to cover a full variety of topics and uh, hopefully engage people from different spheres. So the focus of this particular round is on basic critical care echo. echo. As a distinct entity from comprehensive echo, which is done by cardiology, they are on the spectrum, and so it's not, um, they're, they're not, uh, you know, diametrically opposed. Where? Yeah. So, but really the focus is on gold work decision making. Yeah, and if I could just comment, I mean, any program that started, you know, when radiology and, the, and Verge had it out, it's because you didn't work together. So, yes. you know, it's more than just a spy, it's actually uh, helpful to have cardiology. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, whether it be equipment, interpretation, ongoing training. Of course, yeah. And again, the, as I mentioned there, just the goal is to, is to really recognize that critical patients present with competing comorbidities and, and really unfavorable times of the day, which may not have access to conventional um, resources unless they're urgently needed. But again, we're, we work collaboratively, and that's really the goal. So our objectives for today, um, this is what I hope you guys can do at the end of this session. Recognizing this is only an hour in time and it's, it's comparatively short, but this will hopefully build up and as, as months go on, I think there will be a collective knowledge that builds up and with some more with hands-on training. I hope you can diagnose and differentiate a pericardial effusion and cardiac ultrasound. Approach diagnostic uncertainly methodically to prevent diagnostic confusion. And integrate your understanding of bedside physiology with hemodynamic consequences of a significant pericardial effusion. It's hamping on. Of course, um, I have a you know big focus on safety and how we apply point of care or critical care ultrasound to patients. Um, we, my goal is really to enhance accurate identification and assessment. Again, prevent diagnostic therapeutic errors. Allow acute care providers to be able to rule out contributions of a pericardial tamponade to the bedside and minimize false positives. Again, this may not always stand 100%, but I hope in many cases we are able to provide enough information to say that we think that this is a much less likely a diagnostic possibility. And again, improve communication between acute care providers and really establish more communication, more of a lingo or lexicon between intensivists and, and cardiologists and radiologists. So why, why I chose pericardial effusion, well, I think it's obvious, but it's difficult to detect by non-echo means. Classic findings are more precisely, they're late findings, which are often preceded by suggestive echo findings. We're confronted with difficult situations at all times of the day and uh, with, with all kinds of very difficult, complex situations and, and echo is one way which can help us kind of cut through some of the noise and hopefully get get more at the signal. Our conventional medical school teaching would teach us that to, to look for Beck's triad which is the the elevated JVP, the muffled heart sounds and the hypotension and this was known back in the mid-60s that that patients with penetrating cardiac trauma 
could have this triad. Of course, this was really specific reference to acute cardiac tamponade in the setting of penetrating cardiac trauma. In fact, you know, a few years after this came out, it was discovered that that, that triad was really seen in a minority of patients, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. And this, the, the aim of, of Beck wasn't actually to, for this to be uh, a classification for subacute or chronic tamponade or chronic pericardial effusions because they're different signs. And so it calls for a different tool. So waiting for a blossom of Beck's triad or any hemodynamic compromise is obviously insufficient. And so the need for diagnostic modalities at the point of care is desperately needed. So we've learned about things like low voltage ECGs being, you know, they're obviously non-specific and be confounded by things like um, COPD and asthma, electrical alternants being non-sensitive, but relatively specific. So these are all kind of uh, contributory findings, but again, don't really get at the exact question. But the real reasons, it can be missed in the patient with shock. High sensitivity and specificity for pericardial effusion at the bedside, even with relatively, uh, even with relatively novice uh, echo or, or novice cardiac ultrasound providers. Increasing the complexity with numerous comorbidities and its reversible etiology of shock and arrest. 